you all for being here. It's really cool to be in a big crowd such as that again. I'll show you what happened last year on, on Tech Nation um, in a second. And um, we are going to help you through um, agile methodologies. Now, of course, you all like agile methodologies, right? Does anybody like Scrum? Oh, <laughs> you're my favorite audience so far, right? <laughs> Good. So we're going to bash a bit on Agile and bash a bit on Scrum and bash a bit on everything that's Agile. And, uh, but we'll tell you also why. So in the, stay, stay here until the end and we'll try to tell you why. So um, this talk is titled Flow and it's the official worst software development methodology ever in history. So uh, that's a big promise, right? And Because uh, there are lots of bad actual uh, methodologies, right? So um, let's get a start. It's going to be quick. Um, so pay attention. And um, um, so this is me. I'm Sander. Um, uh, I'm an independent dad. I have three kids, which is um, sort of taking most of my time. And, and then I do speak a bit, and I travel a bit, and I write a bit. Usually, I'm uh, a CTO. I'm the CTO for iBoot e-commerce company. Some of the people in my team are here. Um, and I write code every day. That's what I do. So um, that is my short introduction, right? Oh, I've never done really any shorter, short. right? No, I'm proud. Um, I'm actually. Oh yeah, this is this is me. Oh, you just got a second slide. Yeah, so I just popped it in actually. This is um, really this true. is this last year's keynote, right? This is the same conference, the same day actually, or actually yesterday. Um, and and this one is what like yesterday. And, and being in front of an audience feels so much better than sitting at your desk and doing online talks. Uh, I'm so glad we're back. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, that was Sorry. a surprise actually. <laughs> um, so I'm Kim. Uh, I work at Schubert Phyllis, uh, we're a high-end consultancy, we uh, do things that uh, really matter for companies, um, we do them really good, uh, at least that's how I think uh, it is, um, and um, that is because it is the things that really matter, so it's what we call mission critical engineering, I'm really proud of being part of that, because it's really um, much fun to do things the way you really want to do them. Uh, I've been in IT since uh, approximately uh, 10 years, um, and I'm still, uh, it's not my first talk, but I'm still excited that my Fitbit just said I'm earning zone minutes because of my high heartbeat, <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> uh, I'll get the hang of it somewhere down the, and otherwise there's beer afterwards and uh, it oh will yeah. be all right. Go ahead. Oh, I forgot to say how long I was in IT. I actually uh, found the manual of my dad's uh, programming um, uh, calculator. That was from 1978, right? So most of you weren't born by then. I wrote my first code in 1978. So um, hopefully that counts for something. Well, we're going to talk about methodologies. When we talk about methodologies, we, of course, have to start at the origin of methodologies, which is way back in the 70s, right? So is anybody born in the 60s here? <laughs> we're still here, right? <laughs> 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 so there's four, like five people here who are the coolest in the audience, right? So uh, no doubt. So in 1970, there was a guy called Winston Royce, and Winston Royce was head of software engineering at Lockheed. They built airplanes, and he thought, you know what? What we're going to do? We're going to do. We're going to create a methodology for writing software because before that, and remember, people started writing software sort of like after the Second World War. There was no methodology at all, right? So he wrote down something that he thought was smart. Now. This white paper is called Managing the Development of Large Software Systems, and it was published in 1970. And actually, you should look this paper up, because it's really, really good, actually. It's written a bit all, but it's, it, it, it is really good. Um, in that particular white paper, there's a picture that you will all recognize, and it's this picture. Sounds familiar? Looks familiar? What is this? Waterfall, right? You know why it's called waterfall? Well, because it dripples down, right? You know the reason why it dripples down? Because the text editors in 1970 could not have seven blocks in a straight line. That is why it's called waterfall, actually. So he wrote in this white paper, well, this is a way that you could do stuff, right? And we've done so for the past 40 to 50 years. And there's still companies out there that do this, right? It should be made illegal, by the way, but OK, there's still companies that do that. Why? Well, people re read the white paper, and they thought, oh, you know what? We're going to base our methodology um, uh, on this particular picture. That was not a very smart idea, by the way. And I'll illustrate that by showing you the next picture in a second. So lots of these methodologies popped up in the 70s that had all these stages in there. Like, well, we do requirements, and then we translate them into software requirements, which is different people doing that. Then we do the analysis. That is analysis doing that. Um, you can recognize those people. They have jackets on with elbow patches. 
Go look in your companies, you'll find them. And then we do some design. None of us do that anymore, right? We don't do design in Agile these days. Then we write some code, and after the code is done, we start testing it, and then we put it into production, and it lasts for a very long time. And we're only going to do each of these stages once, because, well, that's the model, right? That means no feedback, no going back into something, oh, wait, we've done the design wrong, we should redo the design. We have new requirements, we should redo it. There were no feedback cycles in, right? It was a once-off methodology. And the nice thing is, or actually not a very nice thing is, Winston Royce did not intend this to be the way of working in software development uh, projects. What he actually said is, this is the following picture in that same white paper, he says, be aware that you should always be able to go back one step, hopefully just one step, but maybe more steps, to be able to pick up the feedback and go on again. He actually, instead of being the father of Waterfall, should have been the grandfather of Agile. Because that is what Agile is all about, right? It's about feedback. It's not about sprints or retros or all the other nonsense. It's about feedback and learning fast. That's what it's all about. And he actually wrote it down. He said, well, note that it is simply the entire process done in miniature to a time scale that is relatively small with respect to the overall effort. He basically says, you need to be able to go back. Trace back, go on again. Find the feedback, go on again. Continuously. That is basically what the white paper in 1970 said. Did we follow up? Nope. We spent tons and millions and billions of money on failing waterfall projects, especially if you work in government, you should recognize this. Um, um, and then, at some point in time, somewhere in the 90s of this century, um, um, we came up with something called Agile. Well, the word Agile didn't come up until 2001, but we had these small iterative approaches. And in the beginning, people thought it must be like, well, it's just, you know, what we're going to do, we're going to write some code, and then afterwards we'll complain, and that's it, right? It's none of that, actually. It's much more formal. And then people came up with, yes, we have to follow the rules, obey the rules of Scrum. Don't do this, by the way, but anyway, a lot of people do this. And, and then Scrum became sort of, well, an analogy for being agile, right? And, oh, yeah, we do Scrum, so we are agile. No way. <laughs> but we'll get to that. <laughs> and then a lot of people said, you know what, agile is actually dead. I read a, a, a thread somewhere earlier this week that, again, repeated agile is dead because, well, we sold out to the people doing certifications, we sold out to the Scrum Alliance, we sold out to SAFE and to all the big consultancies out there, et cetera, et cetera, which is all true, by the way. So then people say, well, we're going to stop going to agile conference. Well, this is a nice example, right? This is by Dave Thomas, one of the signees of the manifesto. He said, I think time has proved me right. The word agile has been subverted to the point where it's effectively meaningless and what passes for an agile community seems to be largely an arena for consultants and vendors to hawk services and products. That's where we are, right? 2022. And if you go to agile conferences, I can recommend you not to, but um, you see quotes like this, right? Make sure you don't miss the agile elephant versus the waterfall elephant in the lobby. What the fuck is that? <laughs> During this session, we're going to discuss the happiness index of projects. Well, you can count me out for that, basically. I'll add ready for celebration before the done column on your Kanban board. God, man. That, well, anyway. So, um, uh, my good friend Alan, he says, well, more and more, I've come to see the, team, the term agile as both unnecessary and self-defeating, right? Agile has basically become to mean, well, do parts of Scrum and Jira badly. That's it. Right? So, we thought... Let's find out a new methodology. Yes. Um, so why a new methodology? Well, it's quite simple. We have done an extensive analysis and we have found, uh, I'm in a, at a consulting company, that there's an interesting relationship between how fast you are developing software and the amount of money you make. Oh. So the longer it takes you to develop software, the more money you make. So actually, what we thought is, well, what if we would make a methodology that actually would make our project's um, duration as long as possible, because then we make more money. And um, to our big surprise, we had found a lot of inspiration in all the method methodologies out there. It's a hard word. Can we find another word? Um, but so, so actually, um, in Scrum, in Agile, in Waterfall, there is loads of inspiration to make your projects last as long as you could possibly think of. Um, and that's cool. So we just summed them up was an easy task to do. Um, so in the end, we're doing this to get more money. Um, and then the first thing we're going to do is the hardest problem to solve, naming our methodology. 
Um, so what we did is um, we had um, some Japanese words on our uh, post-its or our Miro boards. We were doing it online. So something with Kanban, Obeya, Origami, that's the art of folding po uh, post-its basically. Um, of course, we need things with Krasi, so holocracy, sociocracy, idiocracy. Um, and of course, we also uh, want it to be something with continuous D. So continuous discovery, continuous disappointment, or continuous disagreement. Um, and of course, we want hashtag no and less yes. So no ops, no projects, no estimates. These exist, by the way. These exist, definitely. Yeah. What also exists is no SQL, uh, no testing, no code. Yep. And um, of course, we want something like serverless or pointless in our name. <laughs> Um, something as a service, so SAS, IaaS, PaaS, TAS, X as a service, so you can fill in anything you would like. Um, but in the end, uh, we thought maybe methodology as a service, mass, um, and, and then we just went for flow because it fits so nicely on laptop stickers, and that was our primary requirement. Crucial, crucial. Um, so we thought of something like this. This is your sticker when you have your basic certification in place. And then when you uh, talk about flow when you're more advanced, you can go with the flow because then you're kind of an insider. Um, and, and maybe when you're more the hipster type, you're doing front-end development, this is your sticker. Um, uh, you can also feel the flow. Um, so that's definitely something we expect long discussions on, which of course make our projects dure longer again. So that's something we really like. Yeah. Surrender to the flow. That's something you will be talking to your managers at, and that will definitely get you a seat at the C-level table. And in the end, what we're doing it for is because we want this sticker on our laptops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so and then the question is, what do we put in there, right? So the first thing I wanted to put in there when we started discussing is, is a thing called sprints. Do you like sprints? Okay, nobody likes them. That's good. Yeah, so, done. Well, <laughs> so we oh, shoot at them, right? There. That's basically the point. Well, the thing about a sprint is, and this is a typical uh, burn down chart from a project that I visited in Brussels, I think it was. And, um, um, and what happened here is that they said, well, yeah, we're going to estimate the work that we can do in these four weeks, because these are monthly sprints, um, and then we're going to just do the work. And uh, the project manager, there was a project manager, he said, yeah, good idea, good idea. So they estimated the work, and of course, you know what happens. We can't estimate, right? We, we, we suck at it, basically. Uh, and so they didn't do the right estimation, according to the project manager. And in the end of the sprint, they had some work left. And they call that a red sprint, because they didn't make the sprint. How many people are here talking about, oh, we didn't make the sprint? That is terrible. No, it's not terrible. It's just, well, we can't estimate right, right? And so adding the exact amount of work in a particular period of time is really hard to do. And the longer the period gets, name it waterfall, the more tough it gets, right? So, um, so what happened to this project? They, had, they went on for months and months and months and months, and they consulted me, and they said, wow, we cannot seem to be able to make the work, and, and we still only have three months to, make, uh, to do all this work, and otherwise the project fails. And I said, well, so I did some of the math. I said, well, you fail every sprint, well, that's what you call it, so did you already plan the work for the rest of the sprints? I said, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, well, you're going to fail. And they did, by the way. So eventually, when they come here, um, the project manager said, we're going to hire more people, which is good because that makes the project longer, right? That's the law, Brooks Law, which basically says adding more resources to a project makes the project even later, right? So add more people to the project, which is already failing, is a guarantee to make it one year longer, right? And you want that, of course. So, um, and then it went on and on and on. And eventually, the project failed, and the project manager was fired. So yes, we'll have sprints in there, right? Yes. And we also need gamification. Oh, yeah. Um, that's uh, on the one hand because people from outside the industry should all be able to come into IT like I did 10 years ago. Um, I'm one of those people, actually. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's also why we want gamification is because we want autonomy on a leash. So one of the things we struggle with in, um, in the Agile Manifesto, it says that teams should be truly self-organizing and autonomous, that they should decide on their own architectures. And we don't really want them to, because we find that very scary. Um, so As a manager, you mean, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. 
Um, and uh, so our teams can be autonomous because we want to adhere to the uh, Agile Manifesto, but they don't get to hire people because they did not do that before and they don't know how to do that. Of course, they don't get to fire people because you can really hurt people with this. Um, they don't get to do appraisals. They're not the best persons to tell each other who work every day together as a team how they think the other one is doing. A, a manager should do that, basically. Yeah, that we only um, like once a month, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and they don't get to decide what they work on because we want a product owner to do that. You don't also have the authority to make stickies yourself or to make backlog items yourself. You have to ask someone. And of course, they don't get to spend money. So um, uh, what they do get, of course, um, so, so what we decide what's on the backlog, of course. We decide who is on what team. We decide what tools they are using, of course. You're up. Um, because we know better. Um, we decide when they have meetings. Um, and of course, um, they do get to decorate their workspace. So, uh, mandatory, by the way, mandatory. And, and of course, if you want a ping pong table, you're allowed to have that and to do your ping pong thingy uh, outside of the meetings, of course. Um, but this is what meetings rooms can, can look like with all this autonomy. So I hope this is something you really want. Um, uh, this was me in a job interview, actually. Um, uh, in this is not a joke, <laughs> by the way. This is actual, really a ball uh, real This is my real leg. Um, and and um, this, well, that was kind of strange. Um, yeah. And that was the punchline for being a really agile company. Um, so, um, yeah, I think we <laughs> definitely want to focus on decorating our workspace so yeah. that our projects run. It's a well-known retailer, if you're wondering. Yeah. <laughs> 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 You're not allowed to tell. <clears throat> <laughs> so anyway, so then we need to talk about teams and roles and resources, of course, right? That's the next big thing. So um, here it is. So if you look at all the agile approaches out there, basically saying, well, so you need small teams, right? If you look at the, the Scrum Guide, whatever version you look at it, it's like something between 6 plus or minus 3, 7 plus or minus 2. I think they now say, like, it's smaller than 10, whatever that may mean, right? So you need small teams. now. If you look into more ad enterprise agile approaches, they say, well, yeah, 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 but what about all the other roles, right? So if you look at disciplined agile, for instance, they have like tons of roles, basically, right? So how do you fit this into a seven people team? The quick answer is you don't, right? So this is only outside the team. <laughs> where's the team? Yeah, we, we didn't put them on the slide. They didn't oh, fit. they didn't fit, right? <laughs> So now recently, actually last week I found this one. This is actually really, really cool, right? This is a thing called Auto Scrum. It actually already exists since 2016, but somehow it popped up on my Twitter timeline. This is a real agile approach from a real company called Accenture. Well, they're not a real company, but it's... <laughs> so, um, and they named it Auto Scrum. I have no idea why, but it has all these people and things in it and FROP. FROP seems to be important. I have no idea what it is, but it has FROP in it, right? So if you have FROP, it's good. So we added FROP to it as well. And then, of course, there's this thing called SAFE. You've probably heard of before. If you work for a large company, you will have. Um, we do our annual SAFE quiz now, which is the question is, where's the customer? <laughs> so here it is. I'm going to show you the picture of SAFE, and then you have to point out where the customer is. And you have to do it quickly. Here's the picture. Can you see it? It is somewhere, right? It's here on the right. <laughs> it's a little figure that's been hit by the train. <laughs> of course, in any safe project, don't worry, the, the trains are not going that fast. They're like steam trains or something, right? So, so yeah, yeah, you do. Okay, so we have to talk about resources, right? Um, resources being sort of, I always ask managers, what do you mean by resources? Do you mean new computers, new tables, new chairs, or what? What? And say, no, 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 people. So, well, then say people. And um, so, yeah, well, basically, we start calling uh, our teams resources anyway, because that's what managers do. They always talk about resources. So, yeah, that's what you need. By the way, if you want to be a real resource in Flow, you need to have a beard. That's mandatory, sorry. So, um, um, that's one thing. Um, and then we have to talk about agile coaches, because the more agile coaches you add to your project, the quick, oh, no, it doesn't get any quicker. It just takes more time and gamification and shit and whatever you do, right? So, we need to have many agile coaches on the team by mandatory, and they go into agile coaching camps. That's that's not a joke, by the way. That's it's true. And they have things like this. Oh, we really enjoyed the first Obey Our Knowledge Network meetup in Amsterdam last Friday. Great group of professionals sharing expertise and experiences. And uh, then they do all sorts of stuff, but it's basically all sorts of gamification. 
They do, they play games basically. This is why you get all these people from outside of the industry coming into software development, having no idea what a line of code is, and then coaching us because they know better because, well, they come from uh, doing games somewhere in Amsterdam, right? That's what they do. Or they do um, this, I like this, uh, liberating structures. These are also all sorts of structures that you can use to make your meetings more fun. I like coding. Coding is my fun. I don't like meetings. Why do I need all these? So we put all the liberating structures in there as well, right? And the only question I have as a developer, um, I'm in my 42nd year of writing code, I think, is where's the fucking code? I don't want to do all of this stuff, right? Do you? No, no. Well, I do all the other stuff. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yes. So uh, what we also need is DevOps, of course. Um, yeah. Because basically, um, so, so somebody came up with an idea that you have to be a full stack developer these days. Mm -hmm. And not only a full stack developer, you have to do dev and ops. Uh, because um, tech is not incredibly complex already. Um, we can definitely put more in everybody's head and expect everybody to understand everything of everything. So uh, let's do that. That will definitely go, uh, go, uh, go slower. Um, so. Um, and we can have long and lengthy discussions about the order in which we place the words. So should it be OpsDev or DevOps? Because OpsDev is front-loading the Ops consideration, so basically making um, infrastructure more important, um, making operations more important than development. <coughs> um, and, and you can definitely have a discussion on that. Um, and, and even uh, you can have discussions like this, where this guy is asking, well, should it maybe be the, uh, sec dev, sec op sec? <laughs> uh, because, um, well, security is very important at the beginning, and it's important in the middle, and it's also important at the end. Um, so maybe this would be good. And, and he's also asking himself, maybe I'm taking it too literally. I'm thinking, yes, maybe. Uh, but of course, we also want the analyst somewhere. We want the oh, tester yeah. somewhere. And we want the project manager somewhere. So we can have all these discussions. Um, and, um, uh, and the funny thing is, if you look at the origination of DevOps, um, it, the, the term was coined by Patrick de Bois. And um, it was simply because Agile system administration uh, didn't fit on a sticker. It was literally that fact. It was too long. So he thought he was organizing a conference to uh, <laughs> talk about how can ops help development to be more agile. So if you're in an agile project and you're finding out that you need a server, an additional server, and you're finding out um, today you want it tomorrow, and that's not usually, back in 2006, how this worked. You have to ask that one month in uh, advance, and then you were already quite a flexible company. So there was never a grand plan for DevOps as a word. It was simply something that sounded nice. Um, but of course, we're going to keep this because we can have all these discussions about the order of words. So what will be Flow's collaboration mindset? Well, um, we thought we want community, so why only business? Let's d definitely go broad. Uh, we want development because we think that code is somewhere important in our development projects and we want some operations. We want analysts and we want security. So that will be comdev ops anal sex. <laughs> <laughs> So, you can say I'm in a true Com DevOps anal sex team, um, and I like it very much. Um, I definitely look forward to having discussions on this one. In the end, we also just what maybe thought it was a little bit lengthy. We're all resources. We're being called resources all the time, so rest will also be very yeah, short. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we, in, 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 we named all the roles and individuals now, right? So we need to talk about teams as well, right? And we need to about things that we can help to break the flow into teams, right? So, so here's some, some, some nice things, right? Stand-up meetings. Do you like stand-up meetings? Uh, I don't, actually. I've been in stand-up meetings for 25 years. It's, it's, it's now a considerable part of my life being in a stand-up meeting, right? It takes up, right, 8% of my life. I actually did the math, which is way too much, right? So that's good. So, um, yeah, everybody likes them, of course. <clears throat> and they break your flow because what happens is, so my team has them at 9.30. 
some of the people on my team get up at, what, how, what time does Eugene start? Is that like at 6 in the morning or something? Sort of like, right? And, and there's other people uh, who are in Ramadan, for instance, they don't start until 11. So yeah, well, so that basically means that the stand-up meetings are somewhere in the middle, and people are already starting. But if you have them in the office at 9.30 in the morning, and everybody comes in between 8.30 and 9.30, um, they're not going to do anything until the stand-up starts, right? You check your mail, you go have some coffee, you talk to people. So that's an hour waste. So that's good, right? So that hour waste that you cannot spend on writing code. So that's good. We need to have them, right, basically. But um, the fact that they're, um, they're, they can be useful because you tend to know what people are doing, especially if you work in a distributed way that we do. Um, yeah, sometimes they're not. So they're far too often. So what we decided um, uh, on Flow is that um, um, basically... First of all, you don't want people to know our resources to know what re other resources are doing, right? Because that might speed up and they might offer their help to other resources, which is what you don't want because you want everybody on their own pit to dive into stuff as long as they can until they get a nervous breakdown. So that's the point, right? So yeah, we'll have stand-ups, but we'll do them once a week uh, uh, for at least an hour. And um, I worked for a company that we worked both for that company, by the way, where they said, yeah, yeah, yeah we're going to do them. Every Tuesday, we'll start at 9, and they usually lasted until 1. That's, this is not a joke, by the way. This is true. Uh, there was a company where that actually happened. Um, and then the same with retrospectives, which is something I hate even more. Um, um, I've been in way too many of these as well, so we stopped doing them, by the way. But um, So, yeah, they're once a month, uh, and, and, and then you spend lots of time preparing for demos, right? Because you need to do a demo to the product owner and the stakeholders and the other resources that are outside of your team and whatever. So that takes lots of time, so that's good, because you waste a lot of time anyway. So, yes, we are going to... well. Um, um, endlessly discuss for at least hours on what we can do better in the team in the next sprint. And then, as a consequence, we don't do it, right? So, um, so you get back to the retrospective the next month. It's exactly the same discussion with exactly the same people with exactly the same outcome, and still nobody's going to do anything, right? So you know what? We decided to do them every two weeks instead of every month. The double the fun, right? So that's it. Um, and, and then, of course, we never follow up on all these improvements. And by the way, we needed a Lego reference in the deck, so here it is. The point is, there's a lot of research out there that says, as a developer, and if you are a developer or anything doing anything creative, you know this, right? You get into flow. Not this flow, but actual flow, right? It means that your hat is somewhere else. It means if people talk to you, you don't hear it. It means that you can be there and then all of a sudden look around and it's three at night. I have that sometimes, by the way. But, um, and, and that means that um, we need to get inflow. And that takes time. That takes about 10 to 15 minutes. So every time you break somebody's flow, you walk up to them and say, hi, how are you doing? Our CEO has the habit of doing that, right? He comes up and he says, hey, how's it going? And he's like, well, what? And, um, and, and then it takes like 10 to 15 minutes to get back in flow. So if you do that like three, four times per day, well, you break flow definitely, right? Nobody will ever come back into flow, right? So we need to do that. So we'll organize random meetings that we're not going to tell anybody about. I actually had to skip a meeting to be here. I, didn't, I only figured out this morning what that was in my agenda. We have them throughout the week, every day, and we discuss whatever we can discuss. So note down this list because these are good topics to sort of break the flow in random meetings everywhere. Right? And they take, of course, about an hour, and everybody can join who wants to. So we'll call them flow meetings just because they break flow. Yes. So what we, of course, need um, is flow in the enterprise, yes. because that's where the real money comes in. Um, so the question we started to ask is, how does Agile scale? As an industry, we started to ask this question. So is it simply multiple instances of the same uh, process, usually Scrum? Um, or does it require some other kind of organization to have the alignments between teams? Something like um, SAFE. Um, or less, <laughs> or um, out of Scrum, or yeah. Spotify model. Spotify. <laughs> yes. I actually definitely. talked to somebody uh, uh, earlier this afternoon and said, yeah, yeah, we're going to organize according to the Spotify model. Yes. I'm like, what? It's 2022. <laughs> Indeed. This but morning, right? Of course, it's a good practice. Let's all copy Spotify. Yeah. Um, because they uh, invented something in their context um, back in 2008, I believe. Uh, they were a very fast growing company. They were growing 8x every year. So every year, um, the company went eight times bigger. Try to perceive how many new colleagues you have. Every team consists of one person who was there last year. The rest was new. So what they um, kind of thought of was we need to have a lot of structure to onboard all these people. 
Um, and we have to make sure that everybody um, connects, that everybody understands. So the, the skill of management versus people was one to two. Every manager had two people. So that's crazy. Um, and, and then, of course, the whole industry says, well, that's a good idea. I'm a company that grows 0.001% uh, per year. Let's copy Spotify. Like, I also like, want this. Like your average bank. And then, of course, as a manager, when you invent this, you don't want to stop your own layer. So you keep the managers in all the layers on top of the Spotify model, which already had a 1 to 2 ratio of managers versus people. That's a good idea. Well, so you, you want Not to right good. That? Oh, sorry. You, you <laughs> once applied at a bank, right? They had like yes. 11 layers of management on top of the Spotify model? I believe seven, but the story gets bigger every time. But uh, yeah, <laughs> but something like that. That's what men do, by the way. Uh, That's what men do, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, so of course you have to do this, copy Spotify. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how will be the, the, the flow collaboration mindset? Well, we thought of big flow framework, BFF. Um, and uh, of course, we're going to start with version 3.0, yeah. like management 3.0, Sociocracy 3. Why use 1 and 2? Because it doesn't sound cool. Um, and then we're going to add more complexity in every iteration of the process. So um, uh, why? Because then we can have courses again and have certifications again so we can make more money. We uh, definitely want to make it so complex that you don't understand. Um, and of course, we will all copy Spotify and Basecamp like all the startups. Yeah, true, true. Yeah, no, well, that remains tooling, right? Because we all know that tools solve our problems, like Jira. And um, so we'll start by having boards, right? If you do Agile, you need all these boards, right? This is a picture I took at, a, uh, at an office of a large consultancy I used to work for in Paris. Uh, and I, yeah, I'll put everything on the board and more stickers and boards and things. And yeah, and it sort of works. Nobody understood what was on them, basically. But um, so we'll have so many of these boards that our clients usually have no idea what's on the board anymore. And they're like, oh, yeah, this is good Agile stuff because you have all these post-its on the stick else and um, everywhere, right? So that's basically what we need to do. Uh, and yeah. Well, um, then they have like these columns, right? And you could have three columns, but why not have 20? Because if you have 20 columns, it takes forever to move your stuff to the right, right? And that's good because it saves time. And then we have enterprise, right? In the enterprise flow uh, approach, we say, okay, we'll put all these boards into a room and we'll call it the board room, basically. <laughs> and then you need to have Jira. Jira is mandatory. So we're not sponsored by Atlassian, but Jira is mandatory, but you are using it all anyway already. Does anybody like Jira? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I proved my point. Basically, people, Jira means Agile, right? If you use Jira, you're Agile. Every manager will say so, right? Oh, but you guys have Jira, right? So you must be Agile. I have no idea why. So it is mandatory. Um, and uh, we can have both a Scrum board and a Kanban board in Jira. Jira applies that. You can do that. So it takes more time to set it up. So you have to hire a consultant to set it up. And you really can good. have a change from a scrum board to a Kanban board. You have to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to. Yeah, true. Yeah, and then we'll put all sorts of stuff in there, like epics and stories and tasks and whatever you can put on it. Um, and we'll do that all the time. Oh, by the way, we need to have issues and tickets. These days, nobody talks anymore about a story or a use case. But yeah, we, we're going to do this ticket. What do you mean? We're not in operations, right? What do you mean we're going to do this ticket? We write software, right? That's not necessarily a ticket. So we put tickets in there. Anyway, so, um, and then we register our estimates and then we make our uh, managers complain because we don't make the estimates uh, as they always do. And uh, it goes on forever and ever, right? So, um, and progress, pff, who cares about progress anymore, right? Um, so we need a chart that will actually show you what your actual progress is not. And you have to let it generate by Jira. So you have to find out what it is. Uh, by the way, this chart, we'll call it the burn chart. Well, because basically we burn all this money and we never get any progress. So uh, it looks a bit like this. This is, by the way, an actual chart from a project. The green line is the amount of points, story points, of course, or whatever, t-shirt sizing, that we actually finished. And the purple line is the, uh, the amount of points that remained. And this is a true case, right? The project never ended. So we made so much money on this project, you don't want to know. So there's some other stuff that you need to do, right? You need to go into an open floor plan. Do you like open floor plans? No, 
none of us do. And there's research that says, well, open floor plans are not good for productivity. So what do companies do? They put everybody in open floor plans. Good idea. So what do we do as resources? We put up our noise canceling headphones. We all have like two to three pairs, so we can put them on the whole day. And that means we never talk to anybody. By the way, you need to have a tattoo on your under, uh, uh, underarm, otherwise you're not a valid resource, right? So. Um, and again, and then we thought, well, basically, if we close down our hearing, we might as well close down our sight as well. So we started doing VR, but it was a bit trouble because then people couldn't read their code anymore. So it went on and on. And then we said, well, you know what? We're going to do just Slack, right? So Slack is a nice way for people to talk to each other without talking to each other. It's like, oh, we'll just send them a Slack message instead of, and we are going to send a Slack message about him. Like he's sitting next to me, I'll send him a Slack message, right? And then we do it all the time. And then we figured out, you know what you could do? You could have pair slacking. <laughs> That's where multiple people are in the same thread and constantly talking to each other while they're sitting next to each other usually. But anyway, so, and then we said, well, we're going to have releases. And with every release, we're going to have a Slack channel. So we have like tons of Slack channels that nobody understands anymore. Uh, and then we can have our agile coaches act as threat police. Uh, I, by the way, I, I'm guilty of that too. I said, no, 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 you need to post that into the thread. Otherwise, we don't do anything with it. That I've actually seen, right? Yeah. So there's one big thing missing. Can you guess what it yep. is? Um, can I guess? Yeah, you can, but oh. you can see the slide. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, of course, we need a manifesto. Yep. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we didn't have that yet. So why? Because a manifesto is a published verbal declaration of the intent, uh, intentions, motives, and views of the user. Or at least that's how it was intended once. Um, so, um, uh, so there are, of course, is there a manifesto for software development? And I think this is a very known one. Uh, this is the Agile Manifesto. Um, so it says individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Um, the bottom line, so somehow everybody stopped after, after the four lines because it says, well, the thing on the right, um, the things on the right are also important. It's just that we think that the things on the left are a little bit more important. So now uh, people are saying, well, we, we cannot do processes and tools. I don't know how Jira still survived. Um, uh, and of course, we cannot do documentation because we're only focusing on working software. Um, so this is how the Agile Manifesto has grown to be. Um, and then came the Software Craftsman Manifesto, um, and came the HR yeah. Manifesto. I like this one. Um, and uh, of course, as a response, came the Programming Motherfucker Manifesto. <laughs> read this, guys. Read this. So, um, yeah, read this indeed. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, of course, we want our own manifesto. So, the Flow Manifest. Um, and we thought, well, it's extensive certification over hands-on experience. Um, copying methodologies, overthinking for yourself, tool-driven confusion, overbuilding working software, and endless meetings over focused flow. This is, by the way, version 2.0. Yeah, this is new. It used to be different. So um, everybody who was already certified needs to recertify. So you're in that you. <laughs> um, and uh, mandatory gamification over authentic auto uh, autonomy. And that is, while we ignore the things on the right, we do the things on the left, just to be clear about it, and then you can stop reading. Yep. And of course, um, because uh, manifestos don't actually have all the other pages, like the Agile Manifesto, it has 12 principles that actually make sense. Uh, we don't spend time on writing those because uh, we can make money in the meantime. Oh, yeah. So we will just call it a micro fest to make that very clear. Yeah. So that brings us to the most important part, I think, of this talk, right? Yeah. I think so, too. It's about certification. Who of you is certified in anything? Except for swimming, of course. <laughs> I have swimming diplomas, actually. Okay, that's only a few. That's good. That's good. Well, um, D d stay with us because um, this this will help, I think. So yeah, certification. So why do you need certification? Well, officially, because you want real professionals on your team, basically, right? And well, the the the, the reason behind it is that people who do certification also need to make money, right? So you pay for certifications and you pay to recertify and you pay to get all these acronyms after your name on LinkedIn, of course, right? So we must have that and we can make lots of money from yeah. it, right? I so just heard we have to do hardcore software engineering. Hardcore software engineering. In a I heard somebody this. say yes. that, yes. <laughs> Dear Elon, yeah, hardcore software engineering. What is that? I have no so idea. People what were you saying when you play hardcore music while you're doing programming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I had all this, yes. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yes. So and then we need to have training course, of course, right? So in Scrum, you have like your two-day training course. And then after your two-day training course, you can do a multiple choice exam, which takes about 30 minutes. Over here, quick, you can do it in five. I actually tried, it works. And, um, and then you can go off and coach every team in the world because that's what it's about, right? So what happened is in this industry, because it is so easy to read a 14-page manual, the Scrum Guide, do a multiple choice certification in like 30 minutes and go off and coach everybody. And that's where we got into the trouble, right? Because if you look into stuff that is really, really hard, like karate, right? So um, you can ask yourself, how much time does it take to become a master at karate? Now, uh, fortunately, I have one next to me. So how many years does that take? <laughs> uh, around 15, tw uh, practicing 20 hours per week. 20 hours per week, 15 years, right? So eat that, scrum masters. <laughs> That's what it takes to become, what, a Dutch champion in karate, right? So that's the point. And in Scrum, it's like, oh, yeah, you go to this training course, you sit there for two days, you learn how to rip off post-its, and then you can do the certification, and then everybody trusts you to solve all the fucking problems in projects. Well, to be honest, you cannot. But we still need certification, right? So in flow certification, what do we do? Well, the good news is everybody in this audience can become a certified flow resource. We just printed T-shirts. So... <laughs> <laughs> really cool, <Front>. right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what do you learn in the, these courses? Well, of course, you learn how to properly rip off post-it notes because that's vital, right? That's one of the things you need to learn. Then you need to learn how to move items on a Jira board. That's thing number two. And the thing number three is learn to decorate your workplace. You get all this nice with scissors and papers and stickers and stuff like that. And that's basically about it. So two-day courses. Why do you need two-day courses for this? Right? You could do like in a one-hour keynote. Then you learn everything there is to know about flow, and then you can go off and do everything what you want to do with your certification, right? So here's the thing. We're going to take the certified flow exam now. It will consist of three multiple choice questions. So you note down the answers, and if you've got them all right, you're actually a flow certified resource. How does that sound, right? So. <laughs> question number one. Are you ready? Um, so, what roles do we have in Flow? Um, managers, project managers and product owners, because they actually do all the work. Uh, we are all one team. Um, lots and lots, except for the testers, of course. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> likes them anyway, right? So Yes. <laughs> and resources. When we're at test conferences, so, we do the other way around, guys. Yeah. <laughs> no, we don't. We still tell them they're useless. No. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, write your answer down. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready for question two? So question two is, what is the goal of retrospectives in Flow? Is it A, to interrupt the daily flow of our resources? Is it B, to endlessly discuss why the resources in our project should work harder, which they usually do, to make sure we spend two days preparing useless demos, or four, to watch demos fail together with our clients? Yes, everybody ready? It's tough, huh? but keep uh, uh -uh. hanging in there. Uh um, so, uh, we have certification in Flow because uh, we want well-trained resources in our project, mm. or um, it makes our methodology look important. Um, flow is so complicated, you need lots and lots of training to become an expert, yep. or we want to make more money. That's the toughest question, right? Yes. So, so, here's the thing, right? We thought, well, we need so uh, as many as we can to be certified flow resources. So, uh, actually, the good thing is all the answers were right. So, that means by now, you are all a certified flow resource. Congratulations, everybody. Very good. So, um, here's the certificate. You can take a picture, put your name in it, hang it on the wall, or download the slide deck, or whatever you do, right? So, that's it. By the way, the nice news is, you have to um, do an annual retribution to of two and two. No, just kidding, right? Yeah. So um, to close off, we're gonna we're gonna tell you what we what we actually believe. So this is the boring part, right? So it's like true. Who does the first one? You do. I do. Yeah. I oh yeah, of course. So here's the thing, right? Um, you can automate the shit out of everything you want. But software is still made by people, not by resources. It's not a factory. It's not where a software assembly line. It's not like the analogy of building a house. It's different with every company, with every team, with every product you're building. 
That means it's creative work. It means we do the work, right? It's not your low-code or no-code tool or Jira that does the work. It's you. That means you are important and vital to building software. And we believe every organization or team will create and evolve the approach that fits them best. Yep. Spotify doesn't do the Spotify model anymore because they're not growing 8x anymore. So don't copy anybody's methodology. It's your company, it's your context, and it's your organization. You have to think for yourself what will work at your company. And you have to shape it and keep on improving it. Continuously. Continuously. Yes. And the third thing is, we strongly believe that personal communication is key, right? That means talking to people, talking to other resources, or we may say, is still vital. That means that in a distributed way that we are now all working, it's tougher, right? It means you have to spend more time in personal communication because face-to-face -face communication is always the best. That's why I'm trying to bring my team slightly back into the office, like two days a week, which is good because it saves a lot of jam traffic jams and we're not going to work uh, 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 in the office. But in the office, you see that the collaboration is so much closer than outside of the office. So yeah. Definitely. And uh, we also believe that trust and personal safety rule so um, we all have our own perspectives, we all have our own context, and um, magic happens when we allow everybody to share what they think and to give space to what they think. And a lot of methodologies are really hurting people because they're shutting people up and they're not welcoming the different uh, perspectives and the different experience. So make sure you have a team where every voice counts. Yes, very much. And also, um, writing software, creating software, building software is not very easy. Edsker Dijkstra once said that it is harder to do software than anything else in this world. And I believe that. It's highly creative work and it takes a lot of focus and a lot of, uh, a lot of your mind. That means you have to allow yourself to have that focus and to get in flow and to not be disrupted from that flow. That's short, right? And everything involves in tech continuously. So learning will be the, the biggest differentiator for how happy you are in a project and how successful you are as a company. So there has to be time for learning. You have to actually guide people because learning is something that's painful and it's, it's scary actually. I, I was just trying to uh, let the lemonade machine work and that was already scary. Like, is everybody looking at how I'm failing? Um, so um, it's, it's scary and it's hard. So there has to be time to guide people in this learning process, to sit together and explain from your seniority, the people from the 60s here, how it's done. Well, also people from the 70s. Yes. Okay. That's, that's good. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> Sorry. You should have said it earlier, right? So, <laughs> so and then the next thing is that we strongly feel that teams who become more and more autonomous making their own decisions, deciding on how they do the work, instead of being guided by some central manager on top says, oh, you do that, you do that, you do that, and why aren't you guys ready yet? It's the end of the sprint. Why didn't you finish this story? Stuff like that, right? So it's highly important to become as autonomous as you can be in any organization. That has to fit your personality as well, right? So it, you need to take into account all these personality traits and, and figure out how to make a team more independent. Because independent and autonomous teams work much better and deliver much better work, right? Definitely. Yep. So, and, and organizations on top of that need to be as flat as possible with as little hierarchy as possible because that gives people space. Um, the people who write software should be the ones who decide how it's done for their context and their project. And hierarchy doesn't help. It really takes away the involvement of leadership and somewhere in the top there's a perception that really is not correct anymore. So make sure it's as flat, flat as possible and make yourself uh, dispensable if you're somewhere in leadership. Yeah, I'm trying to. Um, and um, then the last thing probably, which is, well, it's not the last thing, but it's almost the last thing. This is me, right? No, somebody who looks like me, but, well, he has more hair, I think. But anyway, so it's, it's about, um, you know, you can get all the certificates you want, it doesn't count. It counts um, um, being having the experience and being able to share that experience with other people, so other people can get more experience as well, right? So it's about again, it's about you. It's about you guys as the guys and girls and whatever gender we have these days. But so for everybody, um, your experience counts, and I'm being able to share that experience. And the most important thing is, I think, and that's why I've been in this industry for so long, is because it's the best industry to be in. Uh, I, I never get into a day that is like dull, right? 
It's about having fun, and it's about having fun all the time, and, um, and, and learning continuously on the, on, the, on the fly. That is what it's all about. It's the biggest compass. Whenever you feel you're not having fun, there's something wrong, and raise yep. your voice. True. Yeah. That's all we have. That's I all guess. we have, right? Wow. Yeah. We went through it. <laughs> <laughs>